All right, we'll call the meeting to order. The meeting has been noticed to Evans Print and Media Group, WCOW Radio, Magnum Radio, La Crosse Tribune, Sparta City Hall, and Sparta Free Library. Mr. Russ, are there any changes to the agenda? No, there is not. All right, I'd request a motion to adopt the agenda. Oh. Motion from Mr. McKenna. Do I have a second? I second. second. A second from Mr. Hendricks. All in favor, say aye. 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 All right, motion carries. If everybody please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And Mr. Russ, if you could please, pre please present the Sparta Area School District mission statement. Yes, our mission statement is to educate all students academically, emotionally, and socially to inspire curiosity and resilience. Thank you for that. Uh, tonight, Mr. Rust, do we have any public input? We have one public input to my knowledge. All right, thank you. Uh, at this time, Ms. Jessica Crandall. So, Ms. Crandall, uh, once you come up to the microphone, if you can just make sure it's a green light, that'd be great. And then uh, Mr. Rust will let you know when you're getting near that three-minute mark. You can go ahead and just adjust the mic down. Perfect. Hi. Um, it was made very clear to me that I would not be told when the child that hurt my daughter would no longer be one-on-one. -on -one. Before school starts, I want it to be known that I do not believe it's a good idea for this child to not be one-on-one, -on -one, even though I have moved my daughter to a safer school. Um, you, we're all very fortunate that the sexual assault that did happen was a child that wasn't in the district and that it didn't happen at school. I fear that he, if he is no longer one-on-one, -on -one, another child will get seriously hurt. If you are considering releasing him from one-on-one -on -one due to budget or staffing, I highly recommend you reconsider it um, because according to the U.S. Department of Justice, 70% of perpetrators of child-on-child -child sexual abuse have between one and nine victims. If you are considering the perpetrator not being one on bet one, I beg you to reconsider. I am literally begging you to reconsider. Please do not let another child get hurt on your watch. That's it. Thank you, Ms. Crandall. That's perfect, thank you so much. All right, at this time, we'll move on to reports. Uh, item 2A, report on upcoming school perception survey. Mr. Russ and Ms. Hauser. Yes, tonight we are uh, pleased to bring you an update on the progress of the school perception survey that we've been working many months on. And uh, we have Matt Wolfert here from Bray and Associates, I'm sorry, Bray Architects, to uh, help us go through the, uh, the importance of the survey, what the survey is, and leading forward. Um, and we're going to dive into actually wording of the survey. Uh, tonight, we're not asking the board necessarily to wordsmith. Uh, we have uh, partners of School Perceptions, Bray, Market, and Johnson, who have a lot more um, experience with surveys, and they have to be set up certain ways and that sort of thing. So we're looking for general ideas and um, I may say hey I think we should do this we may should do that we would probably we would take it into advisement and talk about it as a team however please know that uh, this is a report and uh, there is no formal action and some of the ideas that might be bounced off or discussed may not make it into the the survey so uh, we're here to give a, an overview of the survey um, and uh, to you know, to, to get your general feedback and you, you'll be able to understand the direction we're going um, and uh, moving forward. So, uh, Matt, we'll take it from here uh, for a couple of slides. Thank you, Sam. Uh, again, great to be here. Matt Wolfert with Bray Architects. Um, I've been involved with school projects for, oh gosh, 25 plus years. We've done over 80 projects with school perceptions. And so I'm here just to kind of introduce the survey approach and strategy to you. So just as a reminder, wh how will this land in people's mailboxes? So. Uh, it's an eight-page document. So as we begin developing this, we really are limited to eight pages. Um, as you all experienced with the facility condition assessment report, there's definitely more than eight pages there. Um, so part of the challenge is taking very complex information and simplifying it in a matter where 
We are conveying our needs, uh, identifying potential solutions, communicating tax impact, generally to community members who don't have a great deal of connection to the school. Over 70% of your constituents likely don't have students in school and don't work for the school district. So that's 70%-ish, usually it's a little more than that, are what's called non-parent, non-staff community members. Again, don't have kids in school, don't work for the school district. They're obviously very influential when it comes to the support or lack of support of, of a potential referendum. So the goal of the survey is to basically act like an interactive newsletter. So you're not going to see a ton of questions in here if you've had a chance to skim it. It's not like this is a survey where every you know, paragraph there's a question. We're trying to educate, we're trying to inform, and then most importantly, we're trying to get really statistically valid feedback uh, from the community on how they feel about, in this case, the operating question and potential capital or facility improvements. So again, as Sam noted, the goal is not to wordsmith. This has not been finalized. You can see there's still some gaps in it. We're still finalizing some descriptions, some budgets, some tax impacts. Um, we're, this has not gone through professional proofing at this point, which will happen uh, before it gets mailed to every community member. Um, so when this is done, and, we're, and, and Sam, I'll turn it back to you kind of to summarize where we're heading next uh, as, as a district. Uh, but the goal will be when done, this will be printed and mailed to every home owner in the school district. So every mailbox in the school district will receive this. They can take it in digital form. There'll be a unique code printed on every one. You can only use that code once. So when you or your spouse or, or your son or daughter take the survey online using that code and somebody else picks up that survey and puts the code in, it'll say rejected, you can't use it. Now you can call the school district and get another code for adult age if you want, or you can mail it back. There'll be an envelope included where you can literally just complete the survey the old fashioned way uh, and mail the survey back to school perceptions and then they will enter the data uh, into the system. So it's just a little bit on process and what our, our goals are for tonight. We want to make sure you as a board are comfortable with the overall strategy because when this data comes back, we want you to be confident in the data. We don't want this to become, well, gosh, you know, in second thought, why did you write the question this way or why did you ask a question that way? We want you to feel confident that the data coming back is to be trusted, supportive or not. That's not the goal of this. The goal is not to write something that's steering a level of support. It's about educating and getting data. So we won't know, we don't have any clue right now where the community stands in terms of these two main questions of operating and capital. Um, but over the next you know, three months, we should have really good data for you uh, based on this document. So Sam, I'll take turn it back to you and I'm happy to jump in wherever the board would like. Thank you, Matt. Uh, once again, the goal is so we can educate and they have a voice. And that is the main thing uh, through the survey as we continue on. Um, update on our progress. We're still planning for uh, to hit this mail, hit the mailboxes late September, early October. Uh, that has been our plan, and we're still on uh, on track for that plan. Um, we did have um, a one change. Well, there's been a lot of changes because we're on like 12, 13, 14 docu drafts. Um, but we discussed originally. We were talking phases. Phase one, phase two, phase three, and as a, as a team, we started to think about, well, what does phases mean? Well, phases means you can do that one, and then you can wait, and then you can do another one, and you can do that. Well, we started to think about it, and that may allude to timing. That may be alluding to X, Y, or Z, but when we went to projects, that means they can be done. The whole project, the whole the whole vision can be done in series of projects. And when we dive into these, um, you'll see project one, project two, project three at Sparta High School. Um, and uh, so we said, well, projects are the way to go. Um, you may see base plan. We're still working through, once again, we're not looking to wordsmith tonight, but the main thing is, is that we went away from phases to projects and we'll communicate that and go from there. Um, before we get into the the survey itself, I want to reinforce what Matt said earlier. This is a draft. This is a draft format. Uh, the professionals have not wordsmith have not gone through this. We just, as a group with Bray, Market, and Johnson, and School Perceptions in the district, work together to craft the overall flow of the survey. And once again, School Perceptions and Bray's had a lot of experience, so we do rely on their expertise. So the first part of the survey is uh, it's a welcome letter from the Board of Education and the superintendent. 
Um, it has instructions in Spanish and English, can be completed by electronic or paper like Matt said, and these are confidential. No names, emails, or anything identifiable information is shared uh, through school perceptions. So this is the front page of the survey. Um, we welcome them. We have a, a rationale, and there's a big middle box there that says you can take it one of two ways. There's a QR code. Uh, you can go to the website, and there's an opportunity that if you do need more codes, just to give us a call. Uh, Spanish-speaking families can call a number, and we'll get them the information in Spanish as well. Um, as you can see, some yellow is still things to be worked through and finalized. Um, for instance, the first one, please complete the survey date uh, by before. We have not set that date yet because we need to finalize the survey and it all depends on printing and posting and that sort of thing. Then at the end, um, a little bit more information and it's from all of us on the stage. And then it goes into referendum funding. Once again, these are just survey over uh, the, the flow. Uh, it goes over type of funding, uh, referendums, I should say, facility versus operating, uh, a past history of our referendum success, and our recent uh, very close failure of our referendum. Describes our potential need. I thought I was doing a good job. Thank you. Um, a potential need for a future $750,000 operating referendum. And people it may be a question, well, why 750? Based on our past history, we've had a lot of success with 750. And at this point, we feel that this is what we need to uh, ask our community. Um, so it actually asks, would you support it? And questions, suggestions, and comments. And here's the wording. It, de it defines what a capital or a facility operation or a referendum is and an operational referendum and past history of where were we at. Further on, and now we have the actual question that we're looking to ask. Would they support a $750,000 operating referendum over the next how many years? We're still looking at that. Our past history, um, we've asked, the district has asked for anywhere between three or five years uh, with the operating referendum in the past. Tells a little bit more about the why, and then it does have an opportunity for questions, comments, and suggestions about getting some feedback from the stakeholders. Then it dives in. To facility challenges. Specifically, it'll talk about some of the red areas in the other buildings, minus Herman, and it talks about the structural challenges at SHS. Uh, we've had listening sessions. We've tried to get as much feedback and much information out as possible, and it states that um, we are not looking at building a new high school due to financial constraints. Uh, of the amount being so large, we would really not be able to do much of anything else. So it gets into the wording of the facility challenge uh, challenges. We put our website on where people can go and view all this, these slides and the past information and read the facility reports, the summaries and that sort of thing. And um, the, the picture is blown up a little bit more on the, uh, on the survey. And for those out in the audience, there is handouts if you have not grabbed them before to make it a little bit more visible. Uh, but the survey will be a little bit larger. Once again, we indicated with the dashed line there that this is the, 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 the area of concern that needs the most attention more immediate. Once again, there is no immediate danger or immediate threat at all. We've had the structural engineers come in, but that's the area that needs to be attended to um, more than others. And this is where we explain that building a new high school really isn't the, uh, an option for us. The rest of the buildings are, are, are very well, well, well kept. They're more new um, and they're sound, I should say. And uh, we, we do have ideas and space for that renovation or expansion as well. 
And just because there's no question there, they can still write their comments and write their, their suggestions or questions that they may have. So that's, you'll see a theme of, hey, we gave them some information. We didn't question them there. However, you do have an opportunity to give some feedback. Mr. Russ, quick question on that. I'm sorry. So yep. on the, the comments, questions, and suggestions, that so when you click the, the online portion, there's going to be a box there for each one of these? Yes, there will be. Okay, thank you. Yep. Yep, well, they're open-ended. Yep. And those comments are all tabulated by school perception, and they, they kick out useful information. Yeah, they will provide you with a theme analysis, common theme analysis after. That usually comes after the quantitative piece. So once you get the statistically valid data portion of the presentation back, a couple weeks later they'll do what they call a theme or trend analysis within the comments and provide you with that as well. Okay, so I'm going to go over the master planning section of the survey. So again, our master plan and the presentations that we've had so far includes nearly all of our district buildings. So we have a master plan for the high school, a master plan for Meadowview, a master plan for Southside, Montessori, we know our red items. We don't have a master plan yet due to um, not having some answers on the future instructional models we may be interested in. In Maplewood, there is no need for a master plan. However, uh, Although we have all of those master plans that we have talked about with the community, um, the sur in the survey process, we were advised that we really need to hone in on what we would go for in the first, basically, referendum. So again, a master plan isn't meant to be taken in one bite of the apple. It's, um, it could be many years to complete the full master plan. And so we need to prioritize which projects we would look at first. And our message has always been that we would look at those red items first. And when I say red items, those are the items on the facility study that are of highest need, and they were in red on the facility study. Those are things like our HVAC systems, our plumbing, our mechanicals, our roofs, things of that nature. At high school, the budget for the red items was significant due to the structural pieces of the 1960s building. And as we've talked about in our Soup with the Soup and our other community engagement, if we're going to address the red items at the high school to the tune of over $40 million, maybe we need to think a little bit bigger. And so that's why the high school is the school that we're focusing on in the study, in addition to the other um, most urgent needs at our other buildings. So in project one on the survey, we're looking at the red items at all buildings, the bus lane at Southside, the main entrance and office reconfiguration at Meadowview, and then uh, the pro first round, or the first project, I suppose, at Sparta High School. And so this is how it's worded on the survey for all of the buildings except for the high school. And you can see again, it's a very condensed version, but we did put the link to the full facility study if people wanna see the full condition reports for each building. For H Sparta High School, um, the colors on the map did change from what we presented at Soup with the Soup. This was due to some feedback we received about people who may have colorblind um, considerations, as well as, um, when we say red items and then we had red on the map, it was confusing people. So we went with colors that are um, conscientious of those who may be colorblind, as well as um, really getting away from the red, green, blue that were used in the facility study. So teal indicates project one, yellow is project two, and orange is project three. The darker teal would be new construction, and the lighter teal would be renovation of existing spaces and so on with the dark yellow and dark orange. This uh, picture is smaller, but in essence, it's this previous picture just pulling out the teal pieces. And the numbers um, then refer to what the, chain, um, what 
those represent. This is a graphic that we'll use going forward in any community presentations. A condensed version of this list is included in the survey. So we outlay project one, which is the biggest project, and then we talk about two other projects that we could do at the high school. A decision that we had to make, and why we're on several drafts in of this survey, is do we prioritize ourselves, which projects come in which order, or do we look for community feedback? And where we are currently at is that we prioritize the project order, meaning we will give the public the option for do we do project one, do we do project one and two, do we do all three projects, or we do, do we do no projects. So there's not an option to do project one and three. We um, made that the order um, and how they would give us their opinion back. So project two is uh, building that addition for the kitchen, food service, cafeteria areas, and then using those existing areas to renovate for uh, better spaces for our band and choir programs, which leaves our band and choir spaces for better back of house, um, fine arts spaces, including redoing the stage in the auditorium. And then project three is a three-court gymnasium and a fitness and weight room. And what this would also create is dedicated space for wrestling, which we do have dedicated space currently, but it's not ADA accessible. And it would create on-site gymnastics, which currently we use a facility um, that's city-owned, not attached to our high school. And then we give the question there on which phase, or which projects would be supported. And then after that, we move into the funding support, where we talk about the benefit of prepaying debt and what our history has been in the district with prepaying debt in the recent years, and that we've saved over $4.4 million. We talk about our mill rate history we do have a chart. Um, the chart that's in there, we're still, that will likely not be the final chart, but right now it's a placeholder. Um, we talk about the mill rate impacts for each project and then go to that support. And I apologize, I spoke out of order, but here's the question with which projects uh, would be supported. We talk about that we'll be debt free within the next couple of years, which is 12 years ahead of schedule, um, that we've saved over 17% uh, on the mill rate over the past five years. And then there's area for the open-ended questions as well. So the final part of the survey talks about uh, the district satisfaction in specific areas. Uh, high quality instruction, keeping you know communication, uh, use of our funds, building pride, and uh, would you recommend our district to other, uh, to friends or family? Um, and it asks, is there anything that makes our district unique or special in that open-ended uh, site? Uh, it also asks about demographic information. Once again, this is all confidential. Um, it just gives us, you'll be able to break down of uh, types of responses and, uh, you know, who, you know, the city of Sparta voted this, the town of Sparta voted that, um, and that sort of thing. Um, if you click ahead, you'll actually see the satisfaction questions on how we are performing. And then the next slide is that demographic information that would give us valuable information about how to uh, proceed if we would move forward with a referendum of, of potential target areas, potential ideas, uh, marketing, and that sort of thing. And that's page seven. Page eight is the, the postmark and the address and that sort of thing. So it's an eight-page survey, which really gets boiled down to seven. Um, at our last meeting, I thought it was interesting that about 1,800 words is what you're aiming for. Um, 
just for, for from their perspective. So it is condensed, it is concise, and our, our main information is to educate and give the, you know, as Matt said earlier, about 70% of our, of, our, of our community may not have a tie to the school directly. So they may not know, they, they probably didn't attend Soup with the Soup, they may not have visited our website, they may have not have heard me on COW, you know, all those other types of ways that we try to get out, this is the best way to get a sense of what they're feeling. Um, when I, we asked about, you know, the, re, the, the reliability, you know, we're, we have a lot of place, you know, box holders, we're looking at about 400. And we're like, whoa, you know, what's going, you know, that just seems low. But you start thinking about presidential elections and elections in general, they call it with 2% of the vote in. How they do that, I don't know, but school perceptions has that information. I believe last time we did this in 2017, we had about 2,000, I believe it was about 2,000 I shared with the board. So very good feedback from that and we're hoping for a lot more. So, Matt, anything before we open it up to questions or comments? No, I think you did a great job summarizing. I th the 400 is the key number for statistically valid data. The more you get, the lower the margin for error. So we definitely want more participation. The typical participation is about 18 to 20%. And again, that may feel low, um, but that does directly correlate. It's, it's a high percentage of those that take the survey vote. They don't even ask the question anymore because it was 95 plus percent of every survey they sent. So they've just realized that that's just valid. They don't have to ask that question. The only other thing I would say is on the back mailing panel, we are going to also uh, encourage community members to attend an informational meeting that we're going to host or two during the survey window. So we're going to use this as a way to encourage people that may want more information to attend another informational meeting because uh, this will be the first time something lands in their mailbox, which is way, the way a lot of our community members still want to receive information. So we're leveraging this mailing to hopefully get a little more interaction and information uh, and attendance at those meetings as well. Thank you for that, Matt, and Mr. Russ, and Ms. Hauser. Uh, at this time, any questions or comments from board members? Uh, Go ahead, Mr. Wells. Yeah, just to be clear, is this survey based on households or based on uh, individuals within that household? So uh, how, how many surveys are we expecting to send out? We will send a survey to every household. So if, if Leah, if you happen to have that number roughly off the top of your head, um, but the number of responses will will just depend on how many in the household want to take it so if you have four voting age members that live in your house you will have one survey that lands in your house and if you want three additional codes you simply call the district office and they will give you three codes so you can have every voting age member of your household will be able to participate it'll take a little extra effort because you'll get one in the mail um, but that's how you control that sample size to make sure that people, we're not sending four to every home and they may only have one voter, for example. And those who might have an absentee ballot, our military families, our, you know, military servicemen, uh, students at our college that are voting, they would have that opportunity to, uh, to get that code. Thanks, Mr. Russ. Other questions or comments? Go ahead, Mrs. Um, Lopez. Um, the one thing before we move on, uh, the question was about, we had about 5,000 box holders or, you know, mailboxes that this will hit. Go for it. Thank you. I yeah. have a, I have maybe three-ish questions. Do you want me just to say one and let everybody yeah. have an opportunity? Yeah. Okay. Well, you can, you can ask all three. Let's just give them a chance. Oh, for sure. Okay. Um, so let me just clear this up. You mentioned at the beginning that if somebody used the code, the digital code, um, and someone else tried, it would not work. But then you said they could take that, I, I thought I heard you say that they could take the physical survey and send it in. Would that be processed even if the code had already been used? No, because when School Perceptions receives the mailed copy, they enter the code that's on that document. So it would get rejected at that point. They would not be able to enter that survey. Okay, very good. Thank you for clearing that up. I appreciate it. Um, and I just had a couple of comments. Um, I personally thought it was pretty well done. I know, Mr. Russ, you asked us not to wordsmith, but there is one um, area that I think <laughs> maybe we would want to um, explain a little bit more, and that is under the referendum funding. It states in the paragraph that um, starts with last year. In response, 
the district closed, one building, et cetera, et cetera. To me, that seemed um, maybe not, it didn't have the right tone that we would want to have, and maybe we could just say something in order to balance the budget, blah, 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 whatever. To me, uh, with all due respect, it seemed confrontational, or a, you didn't, and so then, therefore, we did this. Um, and then I would explain why we would have a decrease of federal funding or just give a little bit of background information. I'm not even perfectly sure myself why we, are, we would have that. And then also under project two and three, um, again, if we could just explain the need for the kitchen space and the gym space, just even one sentence for each of those so that we could stay within those 1,800 words but still get a little bit more education for our community members. Thank you. Thank you for that feedback. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Lopez. Any other questions or comments? Mr. McKenna, go ahead. Yeah, I have a couple questions in regards to the paragraph um, below the funding support. Uh, it looks like we're projecting that we're going to have debt paid off in 2026. Uh, 12 years ahead of schedule, but the, the 4.4 million, I believe, is our savings in interest through today. Could we project that out as a total savings to 2026 as well? Um, and then is it also beneficial to show the amount of state equalization aid we've received due to making our payments 12 years ahead of time? We, we've pulled that those payments forward for our community. Thank and you for that, Mr. McKenna. Any other questions or comments? Oh, yeah, go I, ahead. I do have one more. Yeah, go ahead. Um, I'm assuming this is by design, but I don't see any dollar values next to project one, two, or three. And we decided just to not talk about how much the projects actually are going to there will be budgets, estimated costs, and tax impacts filled in. We, we as a team kind of changed on Market Johnson a little late in the game. We moved okay. a project from project two to project one. I saw that. And so they're, they're trying to get their estimate accurate before okay. we place the numbers. But the, all the areas that are X's or dollar signs or tax impacts, those will be filled in and communicated very directly. That's critically important. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah. That chart that wasn't on the wasn't on the slides, there'll be a chart to that. That's right. Okay. Other questions or comments? Mr. Hendricks, go ahead. In uh, project one with the list that has the key to the different parts of the buildings, will there be any additional explanation of the need? So for instance, replace flooring and bleachers in Elton Ask Gymnasium, that kind of stuff. I, I'm not aware that there's a problem with the floor and I don't think many others would be. Um, and so I'm just concerned that we list things we're going to do, but um, no explanation as to why. Thank you, Mr. Go ahead, Matt. Yeah. Yeah, very briefly. I think you're, you're both pointing out some, some good feedback on the facility challenges section. Maybe we should do a little more than focusing as much on the, the structural challenge and maybe detail out a little bit more of the needs that are driving some of the proposed solutions. I, I think you're on the right track. We're trying to separate the challenges and the solutions in two sections, but sometimes we may have to blur that a little bit by putting more descriptive descriptors into the project description. So I, that's very good feedback, and, and we'll look at that as a team. Thank you for that. Any, any further, Mr. Hendricks? Okay. Yeah, go for it. We have one other. Um, so when... When the um, survey is finalized, will it be subject to board approval, or, or we ju we're just giving input? We're just looking for input at this time, but the, we won't. Well, this will be the, the this will be the one shot that the board will have just to make sure that we keep our timelines. Okay. Even you know we we talked about you know it's it's coming from you guys as well. And I even mentioned, is this coming from me? Is it coming from the board? We even talked about, well, they're not a formally approving. That's pretty typical standard language that is, it, it's coming from all of us. Other questions or comments? Mr. Wells, go ahead. Yeah, I could imagine a hypothetical situation where someone would realize that there would be both of, both the capital 
and the operational referendum on the ballot and then decide to do neither. But if there was only one, they'd more likely to vote for one. I could just imagine a situation that there would be that type of person in the Sparta area. So if there is any way that we can incorporate a question where if X was on the ballot or something, would you vote for X or Y or just something along those lines. Uh, it might be too uh, obscure or too uh, niche, but at the same time, it, it might it might lead us to get the information we need. I think that's a great point. We'll talk to school perceptions about how they structure those, if that works or not. I appreciate your your comment on if I'm providing a response in the survey to the capital question, right? I'm four pages away from when I provided feedback on the operating question. So I may not calculate that tax impact into my decision on the debt. So I think we'll talk to them and see if there's any strategies they have to make sure that people are remembering that there is a layered tax impact, right? The operating one potentially and the capital two. That's a good observation. Any further questions or comments? So make sure I give everybody an opportunity. Mr. Burns Gilbert, go ahead. Yeah. Um, can y'all speak a little bit more to the limit of the eight pages and the, what did you say, 1,800 words a little bit? I, a lot of my feedback was um, framed around this. This is, you know, some of the conversations we've had before about storytelling and right highlighting those needs. And if this is going to every mailbox, how can we use this to our fullest advantage there? So that... Uh, can you talk more about kind of what that looks like and why? Yeah, there's a, just a direct connection, but some of it is just logistics of mailing and how many pages of paper, and so you can't really just say, I want nine, right? Or So there's some just the realities of how this is actually put together and assembled that results in eight or 12. I can't remember the exact numbers. The other piece, the words and the length directly connect to participation rate. So School Perception has done over a thousand surveys related to potential facility referendums around the region, Wisconsin, Minnesota, elsewhere. And the more words and the more pages, the lower response rate that they've tracked. So is there times that it gets to be a little longer? Some districts insist on it. We have a few that do, but we have seen they get more like 15% response or, or even lower because that durate, that length and the amount of reading just ends up turning people off and then they don't engage. So I appreciate where you're coming from, right? There's, there's more of a story to tell here. Um, we're trying to hit that sweet spot of high participation rate and still providing enough information for people to make an informed decision. Um, thanks for that, that's, that's helpful. I think, uh, can. Can we talk more too about the inclusion of the demographics and the district? I mean, all of those questions really at the end are overall are not related to facilities at all. So can we talk about why that's a priority? Yeah, so we need, when, when you see this data come back from school perceptions, they're gonna break the responses down into three categories, parents, <laughs> staff, non-parent, non-staff. So that's critically important because if we just look at parent data or we just look at staff data, we're over-representing their quantity in the sample size. And so we need the demographic information to be able to say wh who in that 70%, that non-parent, non-staff group. I'll tell you right now, we're gonna make our decisions as a group, the majority based on that non-parent, non-staff response rate because they just frankly have more votes than everybody else. They have 70 plus percent of the votes. So if they're not supportive and we can't isolate them in the sample, we don't know them individually, right? We have no way of tracking the code to the household, no, no ability to do that. But we can at least take the data and break it down and say, here's how the non-parent, non-staff group feels about operating, feels about capital. Same thing for parents, same thing for staff. We can look at the geographies people live in. Are we, for some reason, getting more support or not enough support in a given township. Maybe we need to do more communication there. Maybe there's another reason we need to help that geography better understand. So it's more about making sure that we can parse the data uh, to see if there's trends in certain areas, but most importantly, it is to identify that non-parent, non-staff, staff and parent subgroups so the data can be accurate. All right. Um. Those are a, a lot of the questions I had. A couple comments, I think, 
Um, and so I wonder if there's a way to, we kind of did it with the building master plans and the, right, the facility study, the hyperlink, the, the website there into the text. Um, I wonder if there's a way we can do that to kind of some of the descriptions, what Mr. Hendricks was saying too, of, I just feel like there's, they're thin. And, and I think what I've heard so far, this, this survey is storytelling and how can we give them the pass to go find more information where that's very clear. Um, along those lines, similar, not wanting to add 12 pages, I definitely get that, want that to be reliable. Um, but some of these, some of these visuals too, right? Like I, I would love for them to be more blown up and visual and, and take up more of that page to be able to have our folks see what that actually looks like, uh, assuming they're not familiar with, uh, haven't been on our high school campus in years, right? Because um, it's it's changed a lot even even over the time there. So that those are a couple of things that I was pulling out of, of wanting to learn more. Um, if we can do some of that to complement this survey and maybe build into those, um, you said we have other sessions that we'll plan while the survey is going on, more educational sessions. Because uh, I think that piece, what I heard from Soup of the Soup of really trying to educate how this isn't a, a, a now decision, it's going to benefit our community for decades down the road and, and how can we help tell that story and if we have to stay to eight pages and whatever words, that, that's not, to me that's not going to be able to even come close to that impact that this will have. Um, I think uh, along those lines, and so this is kind of going that route too, but I, I really was hoping to see more of that kind of master plan layout with years and timelines and you know, allowing our community to know that we, we see this now and see these issues that we're trying to solve now and how that connects to the larger picture to be able to better trust and support and be transparent in what that long-term plan looks like. And again, everything you all explained tonight makes sense. We're, we're limited with what we have and want to keep the data reliable. So I'm also really... Uh, uh, what's the word? Um, I'm really good at writing long emails myself, so that's that's part of one of my strengths is rambling. But I, I do think that will be helpful for a lot of our our, our constituents and voters. That uh, over the last few years of how can we be more transparent and how can we uh, communicate that there is a plan in place beyond just this phase or project one, two, and, and a right in these specific buildings. Um, including community partners in those pieces too. I think the last one too that, and again, maybe it makes sense. To me, I really thought that this would be a good chance to gauge uh, that daycare situation, right? Being able to see if that's something that our community would want us to shift towards and prioritize more than a three court gymnasium, right? And some of those pieces. So I, I didn't see any of those open, and maybe that's we reword some of those open-ended text boxes to allow them for input and ideas and, and giving them that voice, but but I just heard of another one in Cashton Close a couple weeks ago, and, and I think that, to me, over the last few years, exploring other districts with that could be a powerful tool for our community members, our employees, right, long-term, in you know, thinking decades down the road. So those are just a few comments I wanted to make sure I, I shared, and also want to you know, recognize, thank you, all the work that has gone into this. This is, is exciting, moving into kind of this next step here. Yeah, I think you bring up a, a number of you, now three talking about the needs needing a little more meat. I think you bring up a great suggestion of maybe it's just another direct link to something that's more than a 300 page report, right? It's something that's summarizing our need in a little longer form than we have here. Uh, has the, the plans in more detail for those that want to dive into them. That way those that are longer form you know, learners or want to read more can, but we don't bog everybody else down in the survey documents. So I think that's a great suggestion. We can surely look at that. Um, and then let's, we'll ask school perceptions about the how they have kind of engaged communities in the daycare conversation before. I, I, it's, you're not unique, right? That, that challenge is everywhere right now, especially in the less urbanized areas. And so I'm, I'm guessing they've got some samples as to how they maybe have tested that without getting into every last detail of here's where it's going, here's how much it costs, et cetera, et cetera. So we'll ask them if they've got any thoughts on how we can dip our toe in there uh, and learn a little more. Any further questions or comments? Uh, Ms. Yep, Mr. Wells, go ahead. Yeah, during my college days, I had a, I had a 
course on sales proposals and the one thing that the prof really pointed out was grabbing their attention from the 10 seconds to the garbage can right because because I know that and, and I apologize if I'm nitpicking here but I could just imagine some of my family members see survey and then it's just in the garbage so something that can either identify our brand or something that could drag them in because uh, I, I believe and I could be wrong but I believe just where it says dear families and community members that's going to be the first page and then and if, if I looked at that that's and if I had no clue directly I see dear families and com community members and then big words take the survey and then all of a sudden I'd be in the bin because I wouldn't just make those connections right away yeah, so. it will arrive flat, so you will have the letter on one side, the mailing label on the other. The logo is intentionally on both sides, hoping that people would engage more with a local matter uh, than they would with a, a national survey or a product-based survey. Um, the other thing the district has to be careful about is we aren't selling anything. We're simply informing, educating, and gathering information. So I, we often have to take the sales hat off, too, and say as much as we want to sell the community, this is really, we have to be careful and just disseminate information and educate and allow people to formulate their own opinion. If there's people that want to pop up in the community and start, let's go way down the road, advocating for a vote yes or a vote no, that can be done, but it's not going to come with district dollars and it's not going to come with the endorsement of the school board or district employees. Those are just private citizens doing their advocacy work. So we will be talking a lot in the future if a referendum does grow out of this about being informational, being educational, not advocating. So that's where this has to walk that fine line. And maybe may, maybe I just meant uh, more or less, when I said sales, just to clear it on the record here, I meant more selling responses, right? Because that, that's really, if we're going to decrease that margin of error, that's, that, that's what I'm more getting at. Because I'd rather have clear-cut information than you know i'd rather even though the average is 20 percent, i'd love to see that 25 30 yep. percent whatever and and that that's pretty much where if we could grab their attention and say hey take this this is really important this 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 affects this this has a potential to affect your life and yep. that, that's a good clarification. you want to drive participation and engagement not drive sales so yeah. that's helpful Th thank you Perfect. Any other questions or comments? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. The um, logo on the front and on the back that you referenced, I didn't even notice it. To me, Sparta Area School District logo is the Spartan head. I'm not sure if we could change that to the Spartan head instead, but I'm not sure when this S became our logo. It doesn't mean much to me personally, but maybe there were Maybe there was a committee, and I apologize if I don't mean to offend anyone. Um, I believe I read that the survey will be published on the website, on Spartan.org website. The results would typically results. be published? The results, yep. excuse me, yes. Correct. Will that include the personalized statements and comments and questions? Yes, typically they would. I will tell you that the School Perceptions is going to encourage you as a board to use the quantitative data to make your decision on how to proceed. The qualitative responses and the comments and, and, and questions, it, you're gonna have three people that say this is the worst idea ever and you're gonna have three people that say this is the best idea ever. So it is hard with, with comments, right, to formulate direction there. What we may do is we may find, and usually this is what happens, data decides direction, the comments and feedback we get will help us potentially develop our communication. Maybe there is a trend around, I don't understand why you need X. Okay, great, right? Let's do more communication around that. Or we have a confusing comment regarding taxes. Maybe we build more direct response to the confusing aspect of the tax piece. So I just wanna be upfront, important comments and questions. Not gonna be super important, I don't think, for you as a board when deciding whether to pursue one or both of these as an option. Okay, I was I was just curious as to whether or not they would be published, and they will be. Yep, they'll be shared okay. with the board. Again, they don't usually come the first night because it takes a little more analysis than the data piece where it calculates itself as the responses are coming in, so that comes a couple weeks later, but you definitely will have it. Okay, 
And on the last page or one of these pages, it would include some more community engagement opportunities. And I was wondering, I guess it based on timeline, but I would hope that um, Ms. Hauser's financial workshop would be one of those that we could include. That's already scheduled for the 20th and pending on print and that sort of thing. It's all depending on the timing. Absolutely. Yep. Thank you so much. Perfect. Uh, any other questions or comments from board members? Really, the only thing I wanted to touch on was, uh, well, there's a number of things that I think our board members spoke about um, throughout this process here. But uh, again, that savings in the debt defeasance, I think that number is really, really important to have under our funding support. So we have that, we have the saved interest, but I think we should tell what the savings was because we did those defeasance payments as well. So that can just be a eight words or, or 10 words. So we can keep it in that 1800. But thank you. Thank you all so much for all the time and effort you put into this in all nine of those drafts. Nine, is, nine or, is short. Yeah. I was gonna say. So, but once again, it is a lot of, it's a, it's a collaborative effort uh, guided by Bray and school perceptions. Uh, Leah has been through this at administrative level. None of the, uh, John has been through uh, one at the administrative level, but not as a board. Um, so it's it, it, this is new territory for a lot of us and learning how it works and yes I was saying yep oh very similar to what Colin said let's do this let's do that let's do that but what as you start going through the process and listening to the experts it's like Sam back off like okay and not a problem um, you know just go supply the coffee and listen and that's okay and that's a great way to start and uh, I've learned so much since then but uh, special thanks to Matt for being here tonight um, and um, I, I, any questions please let us know you have the the, the survey um, the slides are already on board docs it'll be shared with the staff um, and uh, we're ready to go uh, for our next step Mr. Russ, real, real quick, so uh, given the fact that this is our only chance for input on this, can you explain just a little bit phase versus project? Because phase felt more inclusive to me, like we're going to be, it, you know, it's it's kind of you, we're phase one of three, right? Or phase one of two. Can you just ex elaborate on that just a little bit? Yeah, I think the real reason we, we kind of transitioned away was phases infers potentially future, which this could be, right? We're, we're not suggesting that it's all or nothing. The phase infers that it automatically could be future. The other thing we sometimes get with phases is people think they're just phases of construction. They aren't actually phases of completion or do we actually take undertake this project right now. So it's nuanced. I think people will see it both ways. They're, I hope they read it as this could be something that's done in the future. But there are obviously efficiencies gained by doing it, doing more at once. Um, but we wanted to give people smaller bites uh, to consider so that we had more than just a yes or no, and then we don't know where to turn if we don't have support. So that was part of the rationale for multiple projects. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for that clarification. Go ahead, Mr. Burns Gilbert. I just was going to clarify, and I think you just maybe answered my question. So we, the board will not get another chance to review this before it goes out to mailboxes. Can we, can we, that's, that was my question, and then if that's true, then I would, ask or request that we would get a chance to see that finished product because we got this about four and a half hours before the meeting started and it's <laughs> not done yet and so I'd yep. love to see what that final version looks like before we you will get the final version before the public releases yes okay yep but not with chance to edits or anything like Most that. likely no that's not our plan at this time just with basic on timeline and that sort of thing our next board meeting on is on September 11th that's some time because we want to make sure if we want to get the September 20th date out there, we can do that. Um, but we're still in the collaborative stages about when to determine it. And um, initially, early this week, we, or early last week, we didn't know if we were going to get to this point. However, a lot of meetings and a lot of revisions and a lot of collaboration got us to this point where the team is feeling very good about the direction and the flow and the information that we get. Uh, the feedback we have tonight was very valuable um, and we'll continue to refine that, but I think we're pretty close once we get some financial information being done uh, with the help of Baird. Baird is there too, Markin and Johnson does the numbers and Baird does the, the mill rates and everything like that. So uh, it does take time to get information to and from. And as how much I'd love to have Matt and his team at Bray just work for us, he's got a lot of other projects as well. Even though it may seem that he's working for us a lot, especially Clint, his, his peer. <laughs> Good. 
All right. Any other questions or comments? Hearing none, we'll move on to report 2B, the Sparta High School Auditorium Report. Thanks again, Matt. Pre appreciate that. And that'll be Mr. Russ and Ms. Hauser. All right. The auditorium report. Um, we were hope we. This is where we're at right now. We still are on track for, um, as it says on the slides, January and February install for lighting, January and March for sound. Um, we're we're working with the electricians to get everything going and, and get on the schedule. Um, Mr. Ford has graciously enough agreed to be the project manager, um, which means. He won't be determining this is where the light goes, this is what kind of sound we need, and that sort of thing, even though he'd love to get into that, I'm sure. Um, it's just more coordinating contractors, making sure the building's available, working with his buildings and grounds team, and, and making sure that everybody's on site. Um, we did ask a little bit more questions about the structural thing, uh, about the structure of the, the auditorium, the stage itself. Um, some some of our stakeholders would love to see a fly uh, a fly loft. Well, a fly loft, if you look straight ahead, if you look straight up, would be that would have to go up probably another 50 feet, and that includes a stress on the foundations and on the footing and everything like that. Um, and that, based on the structural engineer, would not be possible without rip basically ripping it all out, doing it with the footings and going from there. Uh, we also thought, I know Ms. Hauser and I were both under the impression that the side walls um, on the sides of the stage um, were not load bearing or anything like that. Uh, and uh, as we learned more and as we had the structural engineer take a look at it again, that is uh, a load. There's a main beam that goes all the way across and if we would need to, if we wanted to remove those side walls, we would be doing pretty much the same thing as the flyway. Um, it would have to be redone and new footings and that sort of thing. So um, we would need a whole new structure there. So uh, currently we're not planning for that. Um, however, there is uh, in the project one, there is the renovation to the back of the auditorium to add more seating. And this has nothing to do with the lights and sounds and curtains and that. That's a goal. That's what we talked about earlier. But structurally, we learned more about what we could do with the auditorium uh, as part of a project one uh, or project two and how we do uh, that auditorium rebuild there. I just wanted to add a few pieces to that. The reason the fly loft and the sidewalls go into the conversation on the progress um, is regarding the curtain. So we talked about do we order the curtain now or later? And then also um, as we continue working with the lighting experts, they um, were questioning these two pieces to see what our intent were. We knew that some stakeholders um, had expressed some changes to these areas. So then we went back to Bray to see is this possible and that's when we found out not with our not with just doing updates to our current system. We'd have to dig down to the footings and redo brand new footings. So that's why it's these two conversations kind of tie together. Um, but what is included in project two is not that those like brick sidewalls that face the audience come out, but behind those it would be cleared out much more for additional space for the for the performers. So it would widen the stage kind of behind those walls, but not in front of. Just to clarify on that, so it, for the board members, the side walls that you're talking about are not the side of the auditorium, but they're the side walls that come out when you're looking at the stage. So you have the, the mm -hmm. main stage and then the side, like these side walls. Here. Yes, yeah. that is correct. Yeah. That is correct. And um, and uh, Ms. Hauser was at a performance and um, was in a, not, in, in a seat that did not have 100% coverage. So it's not uncommon at a professional theater. It's not uncommon that you may have a little bit of a struct view uh, during some port. Not ideal, but they're not as bad as euchre seats. But you just don't get that hundred percent all the time. And then again, the thought process is behind that those side walls is where the expansion would then take place. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Uh, any other questions or comments from board members? Go ahead, Mrs. Lopez. Thank you for explaining the sidewalls because I was completely thinking of the sidewalls of where the seating is. So 
if the sidewalls are load bearing and they cannot be removed, what is the purpose of expanding the performance area behind those walls? I am not an expert on performance area, but from what I understand, so there's more room to stage the props and the performers and things more on stage storage, I guess, during the performance. Yeah, as, as of right now, oh, yeah. I was about to say for, for storing is a big thing with, if we don't have the fly loft, those different sets got to go somewhere. So we could push those sets to the side and gives them more areas. The performers would have more area to move, or it could be just for staging. Just yeah. Moving that. As of right now, the the side stages there's about six feet on the left side. When you go back there, there's a huge storage area back that they could open up and have really nice large side stages. Same with the right side of the stage, they could open that up as well. So that's kind of the thought process: is take care of the house now, with with exception to the new seatings or additional seating we could have, and then the larger project would then be backstage, moving towards the choir room, band area, and so on. So there's, yeah, wing space essentially is what it's called. I guess I'm still going here. Yeah, so uh, so item 2C, the Montessori Charter School Report. Dr. Wendy Burnett. It's green. Good evening. So we have quite a few things to share for, from Sparta Montessori this year. Um, first, I wanted to share our mission and vision, and I can't see that from here. I think I'm getting old. Here we are. So our mission and vision here, we got together as a governance board um, in my first year as a principal and have recently revisited it as a leadership team to ensure that it still um, embodies what we want it to as a Montessori building. Um, so I wanted to make sure to share that with you this evening and let you know that we keep it in front of our faces so it guides us and um, tells us where we're going. Our governing board um, at the moment is Rachel Frazee. She's our president, Shannon Ontiveros, Larcy Bendris, and Megan Ellens. Um, we have Rachel and Shannon with us this evening. Um, this is a photo from our bridge ceremony this spring. Um, every three years at Montessori, we have a bridging ceremony. So when they leave Children's House, which is pre-K and K, they get to walk across the bridge into E1, which is grades one, two, and three. When they leave third grade, they cross the bridge into grade four, and when they leave sixth grade, they cross the bridge into middle school. So we usually have this on the last day of school, depending on the schedule, and it's lovely. I would encourage you all to check it out sometime if you have never. Our enrollment has been growing. Back in 2018 and 19, we were at 159, and then we grew, we dropped a little the year of COVID, um, but then we've been at 187 the last two years, and that's because that is about our capacity right now. Um, we don't really have a lot more room. Um, the photos here, we did a Share the Love cereal drive. I was, I tried to attach the video of them all falling down like dominoes, but, um, the the video file was not the right type so i just shared a picture because that was a really big pile of, of cereal and we were very proud of ourselves and then we've got a couple of girls during pe down at the bottom <clears throat> next one of the things in our charter is to send a parent survey once a year to montessori families so i picked out four of the questions that we asked to share those data. Um, the one question was, overall, how satisfied are you with Sparta Montessori School? And out of 68 responses, all of them chose the middle or higher. Five is the most satisfied they could choose um, with all of these questions. The next 
question, my student's teacher is accessible, and it was strongly disagree, disagree, neutral, um, agree, and strongly agree. Those were the choices, one through five. The next one, my student's teacher treats him or her with respect, and there's a strong sense of community at Sparta Montessori. Um, as I mentioned, we did have 68 responses, so that is approximately one response for every three children, just under that, um, just over that, I'm sorry. So that's actually a pretty good return. Um, the gentleman from Bray mentioned that 20% response rate on a survey is pretty good. Um, I'd heard 25, it probably depends on what the situation is, but I thought that about 33% was pretty good. <clears throat> Next, I wanted to share a little bit of testing data. This is also included in our charter <clears throat> as one of our measuring points. So this, there's a lot of information in this little data, <clears throat> excuse me, in these two little charts because you can see the grade bands that all of our kids um, fell into in reading and the ones, does this thing have a laser? Um, the ones at the top are their fall results, and the ones at the bottom are their spring results. So if you look, for instance, at first grade, in the fall, they were at the 57th percentile, and then in the spring, they moved up to the 47th percentile. So in reading, they all moved up. Math tells a similar, but not exactly the same story. All but two moved up. I also wanted to share some photos and share a little bit more about um, what we do at Montessori that isn't academics because relationships are as important to academics as academics. So the top left photo is another photo from our bridging ceremony. It's our other E2 class. They're leaving um, because they're done with sixth grade, so they'll be going to the middle school. Excuse me, Dr. Burnett, if you want to promote one oh, more I'm slide. Sorry. There you go. Nope, no worries. I'm pushing two buttons. I apologize. Um, the one in the bottom middle is a group of kids who helped Mr. Nakowitz, our counselor, um, refurbish the peace garden and put in mulch this spring so it looked beautiful for our bridging ceremony. The top is the cake that we get every year for the bridging ceremony. And then in the bottom right was, um, were the winners from our readathon that we did in May. Something that we're working on new this year that we're really excited about. Um, some of the other administrators and I went to a conference back in June called Behavior Solutions. And uh, the presenter was a man named Dr. John Hannigan. And he is part of the group that works with Solution Tree. And they created the inverted RTI pyramid. You guys may or may not know what that is, but it's the same group that we work with to improve our RTI process. When we came home, I took his recommendations and ran with it and formed a leadership team at Montessori. Um, we identified our five overarching values that we hold dear based on our mission at Montessori. We identified them as grace, courtesy, peace, engagement, and determination. And I wanna be clear that we are not aiming to have this take over the Spartan way. That's a district-wide initiative. It's important to all of us. What we wanted was something that we can point to that makes us individual as Montessorians and that our entire building identifies with and we can own it. So once we identified those, we um, identified what we believe 
are the most important behaviors that go with those values. So that's our big five behaviors. They use kind words and tone, have a safe body, use an appropriate voice level, do your job and do your best. Then we narrowed it to the nine areas of the building and we, we actually identified all the behaviors that teachers should be expecting from their students and we didn't wanna show that to the students because it's a very large document. Um, we wanted something that was not overwhelming for kids, so we identified two behaviors in each area of the building. This chart is going to be student-facing, and if we see a kid struggling, we can say, hey, Johnny, what are you struggling with right now, and kind of refer to this chart, and Johnny's gonna know, oh, I'm not doing my job right now, or I'm not doing my best, because we all have common language that we can use. So this is something that we're just rolling out, but I'm very excited to have a framework and to have built this from the ground up with our staff and have it be something that we can all own and something that is going to really help support our students and staff with something we struggled with last year. I'm sure that you probably have some questions about um, our needs that we were talking about. I didn't mention um, expansion at all. Um, we do have room right now for one 789 classroom at Montessori. Um, after that, we would be out of room. Um, that's part of the reason Rachel's here if you have any questions regarding that. Um, otherwise, all, we're all open to questions. Thank you for that, Dr. Burnett. Any mm -hmm. questions or comments from board members at this time? Mrs. Lopez, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. Mm -hmm. I don't know what RTI stands for, but I do really like your new proposal for the kids, this, this um, forward-facing slide or poster or whatever they'll be looking mm -hmm. at. Um, I am curious, in the bathroom, mm -hmm. um, can you explain the 2-2-2? Two, two, two? Um, I wasn't sure. What though, like two minutes, is that wash your hands for two minutes or be in the bathroom no, for two minutes? <laughs> try to be in and out of the bathroom in two minutes. Okay. Two pumps. Uh, two pumps of soap and two pushes of the paper towel. Perfect. Thank you. Being resource conscious. Absolutely. Thank you for asking. <laughs> and RTI is response to intervention. So academically, if a student is not performing where we want them to be, specific supports are put in place. So intervention or a response to instruction. Uh, it really depends on either one it is. So it's very similar with behavior. If we teach, you know, the universal, hey, this is how we act, you know, two pumps, two paper towels. If we have a student who is doing pumps too many times, that's a response to that intervention or response to the instruction. So that student might need a little bit more rather than, hey, it's two and two. Yep, everybody got it. So it's really to uh, intervene on, in, on the behavior side just as much as the academic side. Thank you. Further questions or comments from board members? Mr. McKenna, go ahead. Just a comment. Thank you um, for recognizing an issue under your building and being proactive in trying to change it. I love the fact you engage your staff. <clears throat> you know, I, I, reading off of the community survey, they understand the plan. They have a voice in creating the plan, create success that's not just in a community, it's in any community, and your school is a community. And by engaging your staff will go a long way to making sure that your plan is successful. Thank you. Thank you. Further questions or comments from board members? Um, I do have a question for, uh, oh, go ahead, Mr. Burns Gilbert, go ahead. Yeah, Dr. Burnett, I was just gonna ask, can you speak to the staffing levels? It looks like it's gone up 30 enrollment, but then, on, I was going to ask about a wait list, but then you mentioned there is one room available for the possible expansion down the road. So I just was curious about what that has looked like and should look like if it's not where it's needed to be. Yes. Um, so we would have room for one additional classroom. Um, that could be a secondary classroom, and that's where we would like it to be. With that said, our um, upper L or grades four, five, and six classrooms are bursting at the seams right now. Um, so there's a good chance we may need it there. Um, in the last five years, we have not added any instructional staff except for one special education aide. We've also added a half-time evening custodian and we added a health aide during COVID. 
Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments? Um, I, I do have a question for Ms. Frazee and Ms. Antiveros, um, and Dr. Burnett, you can help as well with this, but uh, mine is asking about expansion. From a governing board standpoint, uh, we're in a different position now than we were a couple of months ago because of um, the high point scenario. I'm just wondering if you as a governing board have, have looked into K through 12 at all, and if, if that's an option you may be looking for um, in the future. Um, this is on. Um, yeah, we were kind of waiting to see the decision of High Point um, uh, for a variety of reasons. Um, but now that that situation has resolved, we have not met as a governing board um, through the summer. Our last meeting was in June 7th, um, and that was when all this was going on. Um, our next meeting will be on September 11th, Monday, um, 4.30 p.m. So I, if you ever are interested in our board meetings, we meet usually the first Monday of the month, and it's every other month I should back up. Unless it falls on a holiday, then it moves to the second, hence why this one's September 11th. And we start on September and meet every other month. We were meeting uh, 5.30. We moved it up to 4.30 to see if we can get more um, parents, et cetera, teachers to come. On recommendation from Mr. Samras, he had mentioned even earlier, but um, I guess the feedback was no. So, <laughs> from some first, some, so I'm trying, I'm trying to get more input. But anyhow, we have not met. Um, we're planning on starting our kick off our school year uh, governing board meeting on September 11th. Um, we have met and talked, you know, in years past about expansion. Um, at this point, it's only ideas. Although when Dr. Wendy, um, you led a meeting um, about the merging, and I think we got a lot of great, you, Mr. Yeah. Schulze, you were there. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of great information that was detailed that I think we could pull from that still. Mm -hmm. uh, but no, we have not met about that in detail. I will let you know, though, that uh, uh, it's very hard to get board members and parent support and input. Um, maybe as you all know as board members. Um, so we're doing our best, and um, if there's anything that timelines or things that we need to know that are very important, we would love for you to reach out because we're just trying to do the best we jo job we can as volunteers. So uh, I'd appreciate that if there's pressing needs that we really need to look at. Thank you so much for that, Ms. Frazee. Yeah, and, and again, I, I would ask Dr. Burnett that you keep an open line of communication with Mr. Russ. Mm -hmm. um, if you can have further discussion with the, the rest of the governance board um, so we can get just a little bit of guidance. You know, we want to make sure that we're doing right by every student within the district, and that includes Montessori. So um, that line of communication is extremely important. Um, I will add that in that same parent survey that we discussed a little while ago, there were about 10% of the parents who responded asked for either a secondary or a K-12 option for Montessori. That wasn't even mentioned in the survey, so I thought it was interesting that, and we weren't even really talking about it at that time, it had just started to become a public point of conversation, so I thought it was really interesting that seven out of 68 people mentioned it. Well, and I think it's really important for us as board members that when, as this facilities referendum potentially starts gaining a footing and, and legs that you know we're, we're hitting in every avenue and that we're going to touch on every building and I know we will help Montessori no matter what but you know I want to make sure that if expansion is in the the nearer future then we need to plan for that now and not a few years from now. Ms. Frazee go ahead. I do want to mention that um, something that we're keeping an eye on is the um, uh, Wisconsin's DPI charter school we're supposedly we're i keep checking almost daily to see if there's some money coming in from the federal government and they said maybe by august they would know for some additional funding for a charter school expansion um so if that were to come through that could really um uh, push us to look at it sooner than later but also we want to keep in mind the referendum because um and those uh charter monies typically it's not uh, brick and mortar right from what I understand, brick and mortar support, meaning it's for um, su supplies or your materials and your uh, initial kind of get up off the ground and running um, sort of thing, but it's not brick and mortar. So, um, gapping training, 
so those are things that we would have to supply as a school district. Um, so that's important that we kind of keep in mind the your planning. So, Perfect. Yeah. And again, thank you for your time and commitment with that. So. All right. Thank you, Dr. Burnett. And then we're going to move right into the sales charter school report. Still Dr. Wendy. All right. So our mission at sales is to provide a safe and productive learning environment for students who have not been successful in a traditional school setting. In doing so, sales will educate students for responsible participation in their home, school, workplace, and community. So um, we have here pictures from graduation, um, our student of the year, and the beginning of our food forest, which um, started just this last year, thanks to Mr. Liebachen. Um, Sales is an at-risk school, and you can see here the at-risk criteria. Um, so they have to be behind in the number of credits, um, behind in skill levels. They, ha they maybe have been truant in the past. They might be teen parents. They might have been ha had some trouble with the law. Our governing board is listed here. They meet once a quarter, Friday mornings. Here's our staff from last year. We have added one more staff member. Ms. Carrie Serta Reyes will be an additional paraprofessional with us this year. I keep forgetting to hit two buttons. I apologize. Um, some of the things we did in service to the community this last year, one thing that I really have to give, well, there are many things that I really need to give um, our sales staff props for, but one of them is how well they do at making sure our kids get out and do service to our community. Um, they cleaned up Memorial Field last year, um, and you can see in the bottom right-hand picture, um, that's in the Lakeview playground, so they didn't just pick up the football field, they also picked up um, the police station playground. Um, they picked apples for the food pantry. Was that it? That was at your house, right? Um, they have created and are upkeeping the food forest. And when we had an open house at the food forest this spring, I was impressed with the kids who arrived on a non-school day and talked to the adults, and I was just very, very proud of them. Um, they wrote 255 Christmas cards to area um, nursing home residents, and you can see the pile on the bottom there. That's this year's Christmas cards. And they helped set up for Mr. Science at um, the museum downtown. Um, next, this is um, the student learning objective for this last year. and. The student learning objective is written by the teachers. They set a goal for what they want their, the students to learn, and then they teach the kids and they measure how well they do. And it can really be, um, sometimes administrators ask for a specific area that they want their teachers to write their SLO. Um, sometimes they don't. This year, Sarah and Kirk chose um, writing and this is the actual chart of where they kept track. Every student met their overall goal. So you can see that um, their scores for prompts one, two, and three, and then um, how much they came up. So the student at the top didn't grow between prompts two and three, but grew four points in prompt, between, prompt, between prompts one and two, so met the three-point goal. So every single kid met the goal, and the goal was 90% of kids. Their math goal was for 90% of students enrolled in a math course to pass with at least 80%. And 91% of our kids had at least an 80% in math. Our attendance goal So this one's a little bit wordy. So they, our, our goal was for 70% of students to attend 85% of days. So we keep track of attendance daily. Um, and then by the hour, 
they, if they, whatever they missed during the week, they need to make up on Fridays. Out of 59 total students in trimester one, 10 didn't meet the attendance goal. In trimester two, 11 didn't. And in trimester three, 12 didn't. But more than 70% of our students still attended at least 85% of our scheduled days. <clears throat> and then our enrollment has grown since COVID by about 20 to 25 kids. Our graduation rate was 95% last year. I apologize that I didn't get that number on there. <clears throat> and then 30 of our graduates responded to our survey on graduation evening. So that's uh, all of our graduates di didn't attend graduation. Um, we had five more. Um, I had a question about the 39% of them who were undecided or seeking employment. And I attribute that to this being on graduation day. I believe now that number to be much lower. And then this is our senior survey data. And I really think that the bottom question says it all. We have the right people at sales because they really truly care about our kids and our kids know it and then they do the work. And this is just the qualitative data, not just the qualitative data, just as important. Questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Burnett. Any questions or comments from board members? First and foremost, I just want to thank you for, for everything. When it comes to, I mean, this is a phenomenal staff that we have at Sales, and, and we appreciate all the hard work and time and effort that they put into each and every student. I have just a quick clarifying question on the attendance goals. Mm -hmm. If you could run back to that, uh, Mr. Gonke, or, uh, or you might have, yeah, Dr. Burnett has it. Uh, so when we look at uh, 10 didn't meet the first trimester, 11 didn't meet second, mm -hmm. um, for lack of a better term, this isn't 11 new kids and then 12 new kids. This is the so same the, child. The reason I said this was a mouthful it was less because 70% of students will attend 85% of scheduled days. It's because um, 59 total students isn't what we had. We had 67. But when students finish their credits, they don't have to come anymore. So they were in and out, so it's a little more difficult to track it. So that's why even though 10 didn't meet in first trimester and 11 didn't meet, we had more kids then, and it wasn't the same kids as first trimester, so it gets a little muddy. Thank you for that clarification. You're welcome. Any other questions or comments on this? All right, Mr. McKenna, go ahead. I want to piggyback on Colin's question from Montessori. You've added 50% to your school essentially and, and I know you've added one EA mm -hmm. do you have enough staff I mean staffing is always we could always use more staffing I'm not going to say that we're comfortable um, could we use a new teacher absolutely um, if we have more than right now our enrollment is 62 if we have more than well I don't think we could take any more without more staff right now is there a wait list? Yes. Um, so we are doing things a little differently this year. We have kids working from home. We've, um, we have kids working on HSEDs who um, don't have enough credits to uh, come to sales. We're, we're doing some things a, different, a little bit different to serve the most kids that we can. 
Mr. Russ, I want to ask you a, a clarifying question that I know you and I have spoken about this a number of times and if there was a need that we would look at hiring somebody right away. Um, is that something that you and Dr. Burnett are maintaining that communication that if you need to add a staff member that we'll get to that immediately? We're in communication about the, the needs and the staffing levels, yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mr. Burns Gilbert, did you have a question or a comment? Oh, great. All right, anything else? Mr. Wells? Can we go back to the slide where it discussed uh, the DPI's high risk? I just want to look at that again. All righty. So I know this is a – got to come up with the right words here. So what if you had a student that was on track to graduation but still met the high risk criteria? Would they still <clears throat> try to graduate at Sparta, uh, yes. the SHS level, or yep. would they? We do whatever we can to help kids graduate from Sparta High School, um, but we take every case on a case-by-case -case basis. We want what is best for each student. So it de really depends. Like, if we have two kids in the same boat, maybe one, it's best for them to stay at Sparta High School. Maybe the other one, it's best for them to come, at sa come to sales. It really depends on each student and what is best for them in their life circumstances. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Schultz. Right. Yeah, go ahead, Mrs. Thank Lopez. You. Dr. Burnett, I remember from last year this sales survey. And I, or at least I ha think I have a memory about it. And I really appreciate you sharing this with us. Um, for me, this speaks volumes, especially the data from the students themselves in their own words. Mm -hmm. More confident, less stressed, more successful, more motivated. Um, I have plans for my future mindful of my actions, et cetera, et cetera. It is absolutely an inspiring and beautiful thing to hear these students speak on their own behalf and um, express what they have learned while at sales. So thank you very, very much. I'll pass it on to Sarah and Kirk and the rest of our staff. All right, thank you, Dr. Burnett. You have a thank nice you. night. All right, moving along to item number three, consent agenda. All board members, please take a look at everything listed there. Um, and if you have no further questions or comments, I'd entertain a motion to approve. I make a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented. I have a motion from Mrs. Lopez. Do I have a second? I'll second. A second from Mr. Wells. Any further discussion on this topic? Roll call. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Motion carries 7 0. Uh, item 4A of business, discussion, and possible action to move the scheduled December and May full board of education meetings. Mr. Yep. Russ. Oh, sorry. Yes, looking ahead to our future board of education meetings, uh, we do have two conflicts for the remainder of the year, uh, specifically with the fourth Monday of December and May. Uh, the fourth December is uh, December 25th, which is a holiday, and um, in May it's Memorial Day. Uh, with that. So um, with that being said, um, we have two recommendations. Um, the one in December for December 25th, move a week earlier uh, because a week after we get into January um, and December is a little bit quieter month typically. Um, but with our possible facilities and stuff like that, um, it may be a little bit more busy, but this is our recommendation to move it up a week. Uh, so we'd have one week between the Committee of the Whole and the full board. In May, May is typically a little bit more uh, busy. Um, so our, our recommendation was to move the Memorial Day, the May 27th, through the Tuesday, the 28th. However, that, that was our recommendation. The alternate date would be the 20th, and then we would only have one week in between. So, um, but um, administrative recommendations are from May, to, or I'm sorry, from the 25th of December to 18th of December, and then uh, from May 27th to the 28th. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. Any questions or comments on this? 
Hearing none, I'd entertain a motion to approve the scheduled December and May meeting adjustments as presented. So moved. I have a motion for Mr. Burns Gilbert. Do I have a second? Second that. A second for Mr. Wells. Any further discussion on this topic? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Item 2B, discussion and possible action to approve grants and donations. Mr. Russ. Yes, we have um, two donations, very generous donations for uh, your approval tonight. Um, we have Nikal who donated a book vending machine to Herman Elementary uh, for about $6,500. I have Mr. Oswald and Mr. Calkins here as well if there's some questions on that. Um, but when you walk into Herman, you will see a vending machine and it's not Pepsi, Coke, or candy bars, it is for books. So uh, NECAL partnered with Herman Elementary and uh, elementary students will have an opportunity to earn tokens and, and, and through their positive behavioral intervention and support systems. And we all know how important it is to get every kid a book uh, with that. So we're very happy that NECAL stepped forward and uh, supplied the, uh, the vending machine. And Herman understands that uh, the books will have to be, you know, they're, they're, they get the book, they get to keep the book. So uh, Mr. Oswald and Herman have determined that that's a priority of theirs, so they will have to build it into their budget moving forward. So, um, and then the other one is uh, Evolutions Coatings for the high school um, these um, very nice donations for the clear powder coating for metal sheets that may have a big mouthful but sometimes we have some students who make some poor choices in a, in a restroom and might uh, some graffiti or carve something in these coatings are much easier to take care of and much easy to clean and easy to remove if needed rather than putting the whole stall and under lockdown and that sort of thing so very generous of evolutions coating with that and mr ford is here to answer any questions with that as well any questions or comments from board members on these two items I would just like to say thank you to NECAL Corporation and, and again, Evolutions Coatings for those, uh, those amazing donations. So with that, I'd approve, or I would entertain a motion to approve the grants and donations as presented. I'll make that motion. Thank you, Mr. Hendricks. Do I have a second? I'll second that. A second from Ms. Behrens. Any further questions or comments on this topic? Roll call. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Yes. Mr. McKenna? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Behrens? Yes. Motion carries 7-0. Thank you very much. Go ahead, Mr. And Russ. just to highlight some other donors for the backpack program, uh, current and development, uh, and the Chamber Golf Outing, concessions, First Sergeant Ricky Merritt and Kimberly Merritt, and the Sparta Area uh, Chamber of Commerce also gave very nice donations to the backpack program, and Walmart uh, gave about $200 of school supplies to Southside. So very thankful for those donors and those donations. Thank you to all of the donors. Item 4C, announcements and information. Mr. Russ. Friday, the first day of school. It is uh, finally here. We've been building up for all this time. Um, our staff has been having the staff development. I know in the weekly notes, Ms. Mansky described some, but uh, social emotional learning was a highlight. School safety was a highlight. De-escalation was a highlight. Um, we had our, had our staff go through technology and cybersecurity training. Uh, so, and the buildings also had a, a leadership role in making sure they had things taken care of, what they needed to get done with. So, um, unfortunately, SHS's open house that was scheduled for last Wednesday had to be uh, postponed to this Wednesday due to the heat. Um, and it wasn't because our chillers weren't working. Um, well, sort of it was. Uh, to yes, today was we began the install of our second chiller and uh, that should be up and running very shortly here. Um, but the one chiller just couldn't keep up with, with we're expecting you know, six, 700 people, windows and doors are open. It, it just wasn't looking good. And uh, we had a plumbing issue at, at high school as well. That plumbing issue is now corrected. So all the restrooms, as far as I know, are up and running. Um, and the plumbing issue at Southside, that took a long time, uh, but that is up and running as well. And um, I want to give a shout out to B&B Plumbing for taking care of us on a very timely manner and making sure that they had staff there and, and very nice of them to do that. So um, we have all staff coming tomorrow 
at SHS, all board members are welcomed. It's noticed and everything like that. Um, the festivities start at 645 tomorrow with a voluntary walk. Uh, we've partnered with Quick Trip for a light breakfast. And then at 8 o'clock is the welcome for probably 45 minutes. So uh, it's an exciting time bringing everyone together. We do have several vendors coming as well uh, that talk about our employee benefits and our employees can ask any questions and they stick around through the morning as well. Um, and then on Friday, all the kids come and it's a very exciting day. So um, looking forward to another great start to the school year. Um, Committee of the Whole, we have the board workshops coming up here and everything, I'm sorry, the regular board meetings. Um, we are planning a budget workshop. It was highlighted, it was mentioned earlier uh, on September 20th. Uh, last year we had a meeting before the annual, we had a workshop before the annual meeting to explain school finance. Um, it'll be another opportunity for our stakeholders to understand maybe the possible impact of uh, future possible referendums. Um, and I know Ms. Hauser and her team are gearing up for another wonderful annual meeting, which is on October. October 19th, uh, 630 here in Meadowview. Um, and we've talked about the news and happenings. Our co-curriculars are up and running. Um, our uh, fine arts are going. Um, our buses will be out and running. Um, so you'll see them out and about. But it, it's just a very exciting time, not just for the, only, the, the Sparta Area School District, but for all districts around the, around the state. So Friday's the big day. We have the three-day weekend. We'll work out all the bugs and, uh, and tweak. Uh, we're in communication with Southwest. Mr. Presswood's doing a very nice job with nutrition services. Ryan Fritch is making sure that our buildings and grounds are all up and running and a lot of coordination there. And um, the building principals are ensuring that uh, the instruction's ready to go on that first day. So. Um, and Mr. Stearman's got uh, all the technology up and running the best we can. Um, I've been pointed behind and Ms. Hauser reminded me of that. So once again, it is a true collaborative work to make this uh, district run, uh, the business run, and making sure that everyone's needs are met. So very exciting times and we still have four days left to prepare. Thank you for that, Mr. Russ. All Mr. right. Gilbert? Oh yeah, yeah go ahead. Do you know the uh, location for the budget workshop on the uh, The right? budget workshop will be at Meadowview. It'll be here. Here. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for that. All right. Item 4D, discussion of possible action for the board to move to closed session under Wisconsin Statute 19.85, parent 1, parent E, to deliberate or negotiate the purchase of public property or the investment of public funds or to conduct public business with competitive or bidding implications and pursuant to Wisconsin Statutes 19.85, Parent D, except as provided in Statute 304.06, Parent, this is a, wow. Okay, Parent 1, Parent EG, and by rule promulgated under Section 304.06, Parent 1, Parent EM, considering a specific applications of probation, extended supervision, or parole, or considering strategy for crime detection or prevention which require a closed session. Do I have a motion? And you have to repeat it. I'll make that motion. <laughs> I have a motion from Mr. Wells. Do I have a second? I'll second. Second from Mr. McKenna. Any further discussion? Roll call. Mr. Schulze? Yes. Ms. Lopez? Yes. Mr. Wells? Yes. Ms. Barons? Yes. Mr. Burns Gilbert? Yes. Mr. Hendricks? Mr. McKenna. Yes. Motion carries 7-0. We're now in closed session. Those on the uh, video live stream and in the audience, um, the video live stream will end uh, very soon here. Um, the closed session will be in the library. Uh, we will come back in here and announce anything in uh, that needs to be announced um, or in what we will come out of closed session back into here and adjourn from here. So. Um, you're welcome to stick around, but uh, the video feed will end at this time.